Hi again, folks. Welcome back. It's another edition of Internal Budget. Brandon Mackey, staff writer for Silver7Sends.com with you here today. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Brandon Mackey underscore the podcast is at Internal Budget. Another very special treat here on the show today. He is the ringside host for Sportsnet and Hockey Night in Canada and one of the coolest and hardest to spell names in sports media, I believe. It's Mr. Kyle Bukoskis. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. That's that's quite the title that I don't think anyone's ever I've heard anyone say before, but uh, I'll gladly take it. Please be honest, man. <laughs> appreciate it. Like I said, I appreciate it. It's a real thrill to have you on. Uh, as someone who always sees you on the broadcast, it's always cool to actually have the, the face-to-face discussion. So I think the first question uh, that I always ask with regards to people in the sports media realm, what's the adjustment been like to covering hockey in, in the age of COVID? Well, it's been a pretty substantial one, but you know, like everybody else, it's been an adjustment just to the way we live our everyday lives. Right. So, um, you know, really the, the biggest one is the fact that you're you know in the building working a game with no fans. Right. And so I got my first taste of that during the playoffs last summer in the bubble between Toronto and Edmonton. I didn't get used to it then. And I'm still not used to it now. It's just a weird, eerie, uh, it just doesn't feel right uh, going into a, a building and, and you're excited to be able to be on the broadcast, to be able to watch a game live, to be so fortunate to be one of the few that's able to get into a building right now to, to watch this stuff happen. Uh, but it still just is, is an odd feeling with, you know, you don't have 18,000, 20,000 people along doing the, the same thing with you. So that's been a, a big adjustment. And obviously just the, the connection to you know, the players and the coaches that uh, you, you became so accustomed to and really took it for granted for, a long time like we did with a lot of stuff and just being able to go down be in the locker room after practices or morning skates and to be able to connect a little bit with the players in, in that sense and to talk to the coaches and to just get a better understanding of, of where their heads are at on everything and now with it all being done over zoom or over a phone call it's just not the same right it's it's this you know no different from um, trying to keep in touch with friends and family uh, over the course of this time that you're used to being able to visit in person and, and you can't and it's just as much as you set stuff up like this uh, it doesn't beat the the real thing in, in person so i'm um, trying to be able to to tell stories and and to be able to to convey kind of what's been been going on with with the team that you're covering the best way possible it it, it has been a challenge in that sense for sure i'd imagine that under ordinary circumstances having ron mclean throw it to you on a hockey night and broadcast hockey night in canada broadcast is probably one of the biggest thrills like i would imagine that's that's something that never gets old, but in an environment now where there are no fans and that atmosphere just isn't there, are you finding it's the same level of excitement and energy or are you kind of having to manufacture your own in some senses? Yeah, I wouldn't go as far as to say manufacture, but it is different, right? Because that was part of it. That's what you, you leaned on when you know you come up at, at seven o'clock. That's usually in you know the few minutes inside the arena where the lights have gone down, whatever the pregame hype video is playing on the video board and the crowd's really starting to get into things and anticipating the, the start of a, a hockey game and just the loud music, the cheering, all of it. That's what you kind of help feed off of you before you go in to do one of those things. So um, certainly the, the adrenaline's still pumping because I mean, you are on, on live TV and, and it's something that you want to do well. You only usually have 30, 45 seconds and, and you don't want to screw that small chunk of, of time up because that kind of sets the stage for your your whole night anyways, or at least kind of that's how I look at it. But um, it's just, again, uh, that's, a, that's another adjustment to the stuff that you're used to feeding off of to to help uh, get yourself amped up for one of those things. Now you got to find it in, in other different ways. So um, that's, that's been a, a change too, but uh, certainly I don't want to go too far as say as I'm manufacturing anything, you know, when I do right. come on the air, I like that all to be genuine. Yeah. It, were that not enough of adjustment though, you've had to deal with the whole divisional structure of the NHL being changed this year. And with you yourself kind of operating within, within the confines of the North division, as someone who kind of operates in the game as a storyteller on these broadcasts, What's changed about the way that you look for these stories, um, if anything, and the way that you cover the game now that it's the same seven teams playing against each other for the course of a season? Yeah, certainly now as we're winding down here, Brandon, the last couple of weeks, that's when you're really feeling it, right? Because you don't have the same, you don't have the fresh matchup that, that kind of gets your juices flowing and looking at something that you haven't looked at before. Um, so that's that's been a, a challenge and an adjustment. But uh, as far as finding stories, you know, again, I, I go back to, being able to before having the ability to just, you know, walk up to a player in the dressing room and just say like, Hey, what's the deal with that there with your stick or anything like that small. 
And it just seemed so easy back then to be able to, to get the story on that. And now that's, it's not as easy to do. So I think it's just changing up the, the avenues in, in which I go down to try to obtain information for little tidbits that could help on the air, you know, whether it's, you know, talking to a, a player's agent or maybe get in touch with, you know, a family member to get a bit of a backstory on, on a player or just anything different from um, what's already being said. I mean, the problem with Zoom is that, you know, everybody sees it, everyone gets access to it. So, um, you know, if, if somebody asks a, a, a great question and gets a great answer, well, now everyone has that quote to run with, right? So how do you find stuff that is a little bit different? And, um, you know, the mindset that we try to have when we go into a show on a Saturday is, you know, give them something they can't get anywhere else. And you can't always uh, deliver on on that uh, on that strategy, but that's certainly, you know, the the, the thought that we always have in the back of our minds. So just trying to find, as I say, different ways, different avenues to, to find uh, some information that, that may not already be out there or maybe not be as well known. Um, that's kind of how I've, I've had to modify going about things. The thing about the pandemic hockey and everything, it seems so regulated, right? Like even in terms of Zoom, um, you know, when you're dealing with a PR person who's, you know, throwing it to different, you know, people to ask the question, are you finding that's been a bit of a struggle as well. Like you don't, like you mentioned that you don't have the same freedom to walk up to a player face to face and everything, but does it almost in a way kind of take away from those relationships with the player in the sense that it's, it's so clinical and, and so organized? Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I kind of get what you're, um, what you're going towards there. And there's, there's an element to that for sure, because uh, a lot of times you're just a voice on, on the other side of, of the speaker for a player or a coach that's sitting in that room doing those, those Zoom interviews, looking into a camera, right? So there isn't that same uh, connection. And I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing for, for me to try to adjust to it, but I really feel for, you know, the writers around the, the league that, that cover the sport, right, that are um, so accustomed to, you know, when they really get the, the good stuff for whatever story they're trying to tell, it's, again, having those one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with players in, in a dress room away from all the other cameras and, and microphones and, and, you know, maybe you ask a question just to kind of get things started and then it's, you know, the eighth or ninth follow-up. You know, eventually you get something that's, that's really good that, that really helps uh, your story stand out and you don't have the chance to, to ask all those follow-ups in the Zoom setting, right? So um, I really feel for 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 those men and women that, that are in those positions that uh, you know that's that's it's it's not easy, right? Again, in a world where um, everyone can easily access all the same quotes, how do you make yourself stand out? I think you know beyond just what I do in my position, it's it's been a challenge for everybody in the the broadcasting and journalism fields here around sport to to try to get something that's that's a bit different. Do you guys in the industry have? any sense of when things are projected to go back to normal? I know it's such a day by day thing here, especially in Ontario where the situation is so, uh, so bleak, but, uh, but I mean, are you targeting anything? Like, are you looking at, okay, next season, we're going to be back into press conferences and scrums and all this stuff, or is it like you're totally flying blind? Yeah, I, I hope so. I would love to see that by next fall, right. To be in a situation where, at least we're a little bit closer to have a little more more access but of course that's that's i'm sure that's pretty far down the the league's to-do list right now there's so many other things that other boxes that have to be ticked off before you get to there i mean right now i gosh i don't even know what playoffs are going to look like here in, in canada right yeah um, you hope that the teams that the four that do make it end up still being able to play in their home buildings but what happens when you get to the third round and now you're playing somebody from the states what's that all going to look like so um we still see it seems like it's such a far far away we're so far away from from that point there, but um, hopefully by by next year. But I really have no sense at, at this point. Yeah, there, there could be playoff hockey in Buffalo this year, but it's the Toronto Maple Leafs, right? It's right? Like, yeah, it's so That's, bizarre. Exactly, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, I'm still not even used to the Blue Jays playing out of Florida, but I would be remiss uh, if I didn't get your thoughts on how things have gone for the Ottawa Senators here, this being an Ottawa Senators podcast and all three people that are listening probably being Senators fans, but <laughs> I, I know a lot's gone on and even through 46-ish games, this has kind of been a blur, but especially as someone who's based mainly in Ottawa, what are some of the storylines about this team that have stood out to you this year? So to me, there's like the season can be told in two different parts, right? You look at it from the perspective of the group of young players that have really gotten an opportunity, particularly over the last couple of months and really now since the, the trade deadline. And that's been terrific, right? Like really, I don't know, you tell me, Brandon, outside of Eric Branstrom, maybe, I think you, you look at the whole crop of, of young players on that team that you at least anticipate to be with this group for a while going forward. 
I don't know if there's one that you could say didn't at least meet expectations and the majority of them have exceeded them, right? It's been really Definitely. wonderful to watch just the growth in, in this season alone, right? Like you knew what Brady Kachuk was for the most part. You knew what Thomas Shabbat was at most part. And I know there's been some times where he's come under criticism, but to that I say, like, just be careful. Remember what you have in terms of a dynamic defenseman that there, you know, back there. Let's, uh, you know, just, just give ourselves – a, a breather here before we start jumping on him for the occasional turnover. When he's it's all too familiar with the dynamic defenseman. <laughs> exactly. Right. We've been down this path before here in Ottawa. Um, so I, I think, but you know, you look at what Josh Norris has become, he hasn't even turned 22 yet. And DJ Smith has no issue putting him in any situation uh, as a center. And, you know, since Alex Formanton has come up, he's developed into a really, really fine penalty killer. And we're seeing him use his speed more and more. Um, I can go down the list. I know, you know, Tim Stutzla maybe is, is fighting it a little bit of late as the production has dropped off and he's just, you know, as other teams are, are figuring him out and now he needs to learn how to adjust himself, but um, he's just getting started and I have no worries there. And uh, I, I just, there's, there's so much positive to look at in, in that sense. And then on the flip side, I think if you look at, you know, what Pierre Dorian did in the off season when it comes to who they brought in via trade and who they signed as free agents, uh, there's not a lot to get excited about there. There was, there was a number of, of misses and, and some of it, you know, um, victim of circumstance. You couldn't have anticipated Derek Stepan to go down with injury and be out for the year uh, or the injury to Austin Watson. I really liked him in that spot on the fourth line. And then when Tremendous. he goes down, yeah. that was that was a tough spot. But, um, you know, I will say I've, I've really enjoyed Artem Zub of late and what he's brought to the table. I think he's been a nice find for them on the back end. But, um, you know, other than that, I mean, Cedric Paquette, didn't work out. Alex Galchenyuk didn't work out. Uh, good Branson, Coburn, right? You go down the list. Um, Josh Brown, he's, he's seeing some time in the lineup here of, of late because the team's winning, but, um, you know, clearly I don't think he's, is part of their, their long-term plan. So uh, maybe that was the plan all along to, to put them in and, and know that they were, weren't going to field a, a very competitive team and they were going to be back down in the, in the mix for, for a lottery pick once, once again. But um, I just think, you know, after an off season where there's so much talk about, you know, we have to be better defensively and that we need to start taking some steps forward. Um, you know, this is a team that, as you know, the last three years finished 30th, 31st and 30th. And up until this last little stretch where they've strung some wins together, they were back down in 30th uh, again. So um, really from that sense, as, as, as a team's perspective is concerned, um, there is a little bit of going, well, you know, you've got all these young players that are really on the cusp of, of taking some, some massive steps as, as a group. And now like the, the big question for me is like, I, I just hope that, that they're able of, they're able to surround them with, with the right pieces when they start to get good and they can, you know, fill out the rest of the roster that is, um, you know, hopefully one day competing for, for a playoff spot, because, you know, as I say, another fourth straight year where you're in the mix for potentially a, a lottery pick at some point, you got to start taking some, some strides here. And so, um, you know, hopefully, and I think they've got the right uh, young core to, to start doing that next year. But as I say, the big question for me is, is what, what are they going to be surrounded with and, and how much of an opportunity are, are they going to legitimately have to, to take some steps forward? And then, and then of course there's the goaltending, which is another I was gonna conversation say. <laughs> in itself. Yeah, I was going to say all that, and you didn't even mention the goaltending and right. Matt, Matt Murray and the barrage of injuries that they incurred. But it's been such a – it's been it feels like it's been a full-length season in this kind of compacted 56-game schedule when you talk about all the different variables that went into it and the different storylines with regards to the Senators themselves. And what's been really fascinating to see is there have been games where this team looked horrible. Like if you remember that early stretch to begin the season, I don't know if you stayed up and watched those late games a lot of the time, but it wasn't oh, yeah. fun. It, uh, <laughs> I was pretty miserable for a couple of weeks there just because I was sleep deprived for watching bad hockey, but, and then they come, you know, they come back from down five, one to beat the Leafs and they have a substantial winning record against Calgary and against Montreal. So in talking about the Leafs in particular, because I do want to zero in on that on that point for a second, you know, that's a team that's a perennial contender. I mean, nobody has any delusions about where they're going to go in the playoffs. I mean, I think they could win the whole thing. It's probably the best shot they've had in the last 10 years or so. But with the Leafs being that type of powerhouse team and Ottawa being motivated and ready to take a step next year, hopefully, and having given them a couple game tough games already this season, is the Battle of Ontario back, do you think? I... I've firmly believe that it'll be back when you, they get a playoff series. 
that's that's my that's my feel of it. Um, that's interesting. I I remember yeah like one of the first games um, I worked on a on a Saturday CBC game. It was a Toronto Montreal game. Um, this was the 16, 17 years. So like Matthews and Marners, that was all their rookie season. Right. And so they were starting to come up again and, and be a bit better team. And, and, you know, Montreal won the, the division that year. Um, and so I, uh, I remember making the point on, on the air, just that, you know, looking at the history of that rivalry two original six teams and, you know, Hey, you know, once again, the rivalry does matter. And, and Jim Houston made the point, you know, what they really need is a playoff series. And, and, and you're right. Like there's, you, you can have some good matchups in, in the regular season where, you know, you see some wild stuff, crazy comebacks, you know, goalie gets injured warm ups, and this unproven kid comes in and gets his first ever win out of nowhere. Um, there's been some, some wild stuff that's happened between uh, these teams already this season, but, you know, in terms of the battle of Ontario and um, what really gets uh, things going, I, I, I believe it's, it's a playoff series. So, um, and when you're in a spot where, you know, maybe there's, um, assuming the schedule is somewhat back to normal next year, where maybe, you know, you got a Saturday night game between uh, Toronto and Ottawa in late March, or early April, that's, that's de determining some playoff seeds, then, then you start to see it. But I would love to see them uh, match up in, in a best of seven again, because that's, of course, when it was at its peak in the early right. 2000s. And uh, I'd love to see it again here now with this new generation of players. Yeah, I think... One thing that everyone in Ottawa is really looking forward to is seeing Brady Kachuk in a playoff series because that is just right. going to be that's going to be so fun to watch. Uh, I honestly don't think I have seen a player as universally beloved in Ottawa it's outside of Mark Stone. Like even Alfredson Carlson, you know, you know very well they had their critics and and mm -hmm. you know I think Brady is that kind of rare breed where it just seems to be one hundred percent fan support behind him. Uh, from a media perspective, um, especially as someone who's seen what's gone on with the team over the past few years, with the departures of guys like Carlson and Stone, can you talk a little bit about what he means to this team and this market? He is, to me, like the 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 lifeblood, the engine, right? Like um, he leads, and and the rest of the group follows. At least that's the perception that that I get in in watching. And, um, I'm sure there's a lot of fans that, that see it similarly, but you know, when, when you just see how he, he speaks about his team and, and his teammates in the media, um, you know, that he's got their backs and you see the, obviously the way he plays on, on the ice, he sticks up for himself. He sticks up for, um, his teammates when, when it's needed. Um, even though that, that, that wouldn't be something that, uh, he necessarily goes out looking for, but when called upon, he has no issue answering the bell there. Um, I just watched the, you know, the way he is able to, to drag his team into the, the fight on a lot of nights. Um, that's, that's what, what jumps out to me. You know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, in the, the start of the year, when it was announced that he was going to be wearing a letter this season and, and everyone kind of shrugged their shoulders and went like, yeah, that was seemed to be expected. Well, it's amazing to me that you feel that way about a player who just turned 21 years old. He's still in his entry level contract. And it just seemed like a fait accompli that he was going to be wearing a letter this season. So I think it just speaks to his leadership. And, and you could tell obviously was uh, raised in, in the right setting with, uh, you know, his dad and his mom, his older brother, his younger sister. Um, you know, that he was, he was in an environment there that, that you learned about being a good person, a good family member, first and foremost, and, and obviously a, a good teammate. And you just see, you know, the way, his father was so respected around the league by players who played with and against him. And uh, he seems like a chip off the old block, right? Uh, you know, I think even more so than, than Matthew, you're seeing comparisons drawn to, to how his, his dad played at, at the peak of, of his heyday. Um, and and if, if you're an Ottawa Senator fan, I think you got to be incredibly excited uh, about that because last time I checked, Keith and Chuck had a pretty darn good career. So it's pretty good. Um, it, yeah. If, if Brady can do anything similar to that, uh, I think then, um, this organization should be in a in a pretty good spot. So um, yeah, I, I I'm always curious to what he has to say about whatever's going on with with the team. And um, yeah, you can you can just tell uh, by how he goes about things. I think uh, I, I believe is he's the future captain of of the team, and that's not you know putting any uh, disrespect towards Thomas Shabbat because I think the world of of him too. But uh, he just seems like the right guy cut out for that job when they do come time to to make a decision there. Yeah, there was some genuine debate last year, but at this point, like, it's like I think yeah. a complete is the perfect way to put it, right? Like, it just it doesn't even seem close as to who should be the captain of this team. And again, no disrespect to a phenomenal player and phenomenal person in Thomas Shabbat, but 
as you mentioned before, we know we knew what to expect from those guys coming into this season. We knew they were going to be phenomenal players to watch and probably how they were going to perform, even within the bizarre context of this COVID season. What's been the biggest surprise for you with regards to the Senators this year? Ooh, that's a good question. Probably just, you know, you knew that there was going to be a handful of young players uh, that were going to get an opportunity. And I just going in, I'm going, well, you hope that a couple of them grab hold of, of a job here and, and really start to establish themselves. And as I said, you know, earlier, Brandon, I, I think, you know, maybe again, outside of Eric, Eric Branson, who's still kind of finding his way, everybody else has, has been absolutely, well, for the most part, lights out in that regard. I mean, just the way that Drake Batherson plays down the confidence that, that he has. And, and again, I go back to, to Josh Norris, who, um, you know, he was obviously a big part of, of the return in that Carlson trade um, when it was made, gosh, almost three years ago now. Um, but I, I think, you know, even at the time he was seen as, as a late round pick and there was some whispers of, well, you know, maybe at best he's, he's a middle six forward. And um, right now he's knocking on the door to be the, the next number one center of, of this team. Right. So, um, I, you know, obviously there's still a long way for, for him to go and, um, you know, you see all the time players have really good rookie seasons and then the sophomore year comes back and there's a bit of an adjustment there to be had. But um, I just love um, the the quiet confidence that, that he has and he's not arrogant. He's not cocky outwardly anyways, but you just know that he is very sure of himself and, and his abilities. And um, so when you have a guy like that who is capable of winning big draws, um, you know, that's that's been great. It's not something that I expected to see in, in full this season. Um, but uh, boy, good, good on him and, and good for the senators that, that they've, they've developed the way that they have and how quickly they have. Mm-hmm. Norris has like eight points in his last five games or something ridiculous like that. He's just been on a tear lately. Yeah. How about the goal in Calgary the other night? Oh my God. That was, gorgeous. That was such a gorgeous release. That was a pro release, right? Like, yeah, exactly. I, I think you nailed it. I think, uh, I think everyone had expectations, especially with him based on how well he played the American hockey league last year being, the first uh, Ottawa Senators prospect to ever be named the AHL's outstanding rookie. But there was another rookie coming into Ottawa this season that I think was carrying a wagon load of hype with him. Give me your assessment of Tim Stutzler's first year in the league. I know everyone's kind of accepted that he's dealing with some fatigue at the tail end of his first season, which is understandable, especially given he played at the World Juniors as well. But what has been watching? What has watching Tim Stutzla been like for you? And does he evoke memories of of any kind of former player, or former senator? Like I had Dean Brown on last week, and he uh, mm-hmm. he, he made some Marion Hosa comparisons. So uh, maybe not as physically you know imposing as Hosa was, but I'll, I'll I'll give you the floor. Like, what's been your assessment of Stutzla, and does he kind of remind you of anyone? Yeah, it's it's tougher to me to do like the historical comparison over the course of the the organization's existence, only because I grew up out west and. Um, you know, I was I was still a bit younger in my years when the organization was coming into its own, so my memory wasn't as great. But I've certainly heard the the Hosa comparison too, right? Just to, in terms of at least the the skill and um, what he can do with with the puck. So that's got to be encouraging. I felt that uh, he was the most hyped prospect coming into this year than um, since Jason Spezza first arrived on the scene with with Ottawa, right? Um, like even Eric Carlson, it wasn't until he got here, and then it was like, oh wait, like this guy's actually a pretty damn good player. And then he grew from there, and yeah. as did the hype. But at least coming in, there was a lot of buzz around him, and and rightfully so. I, I thought he's he's handled himself, you know, in, incredibly well. And you think too, like you go from um, being drafted and then, you know, there's the injury right away and you're rehabbing that. And then you go right into the bubble in Edmonton for the world juniors. And then there's an outbreak within your team. So you're stuck in quarantine. And, you know, we all remember how that all unfolded and he's playing with like nine other guys that they're dressing in the start of that tournament and him and JJ Paterka are carrying them all the way into the quarterfinals. They get knocked out. He comes right to Ottawa. He quarantines for a week. He practices like three times and then the season starts and uh, he scores that beauty of a goal in his second game um, that he'll remember for a really long time. And, you know, he he misses a bit of time again with an injury that something that was nagging him in the world juniors. And you just think of all that in a very short period of time, like that's, that's tough to deal with for a guy that had just turned 19 years old. Um, So you can understand that there's a bit of an adjustment there, but um, you see glimpses. I know DJ Smith has talked about it. You know, every night he does two or three things on the ice that not many other players in this league can do. And uh, you can see it, right? There's, there's reasons why he was selected uh, where he did. And 
Um, certainly, I don't think there would be any buyer's remorse uh, in, in the, the minds of Pierre Dorian and the Ottawa Senators. Obviously, their scouting staff did a terrific job. And um, I mean, it did help making them easy. They're picking third and that um, Lafreniere and Byfield were already taken at that point. Yeah. But um, so I just think the way the way he's gone about things and, and you can tell like he's he's not afraid to, to want the puck. And it's it gets I get a chuckle sometimes watching on the power play. And, you know, maybe they're struggling a little bit and in, in gaining the zone. And they, they do that silly drop back pass that drives yes. everybody nuts. Um, but there you go. I've seen moments where, you know, he's looking and he wants the puck. And if it doesn't get passed to him, like he's he gets mad. And so I, I don't know if it's something that, you know, a teammate has to, you know, just keep him. Uh, calm a little bit on, on the bench in between shifts so he doesn't quite lose himself uh, completely emotionally. But um, the fact that he's invested like that, I think it's, it's, it's a real good sign, right? I mean, I believe he's, he's going to get stronger over the course of, of this summer, uh, a summer that hopefully looks a little more normal for him. And when he comes back in the fall, uh, gosh, who knows what uh, he'll have in, in store. For him to get his feet wet here under these circumstances and all that was around him going in, um, for him to have a year like this where he's still averaging, I believe, over a half point per game, yeah. uh, I, I, I firmly believe those totals are just going to go up from here. Yeah, they're, they're especially skewed when you think he had, I think it was a 13-game goal, 13 game goalish streak where he just, and it wasn't for a lack of effort. Like, he just had right. some horrible shooting luck. He hit some posts. He got robbed a few times. I think he broke it in the last Toronto game. And before that, if you remember, he hit the post right before that on Batherson's goal, on a goalish right. shooting on in, right? Like, the guy just yeah. could not buy one. So you're you're spot on. I'm really excited to see what he can do after a full off season and as he kind of grows into the NHL game a little more. I do want to transition to the broader context of the North Division. And chief on everyone's mind has been the Vancouver Canucks situation over the past couple of weeks. And terrifying from a human perspective, but they come back from and amid all this controversy, it kind of begrudgingly almost they come back to play and then they beat the Leafs twice. So I, I don't know how closely you followed those two games, but kind of give me your thoughts on them because I know they, they like, let's be honest, the Leafs got goalied, but how crazy has this situation been? And uh, I don't know if you've heard anything that, uh, that maybe the rest of us haven't about it and about the specifics that the Canucks were going through, but, uh, but give me your thoughts on this whole debacle. Well, I just, it's, it's tough to, to put into words because um, you know, knock on wood, I'm fortunate that I haven't gone through, through anything like that. Um, I, I can't imagine it's one thing, you know, as an athlete, if, if you get it and you're dealing with it, but now all of a sudden, like your wife or girlfriend now has it and there's other members in the family that you've passed it on to, like just mentally how you deal with all of that. And you've got teammates everywhere that are all laid up and, and trying to recover and, and are in quite the battle with this thing. That's, it's unbelievable to try to imagine what, what that all would have, would have been like. I, I just thought, um, watching those two games against Toronto, it's, it's amazing what, um, you know, just the the, the pride and, and the determination of an elite uh, athlete has uh, in, in those moments, right, where everyone's expecting Toronto to walk over them. And uh, certainly their lungs were burning, particularly in that first game and early on where they just, because of the fact that they hadn't played in several weeks and just had a few practices beforehand, um, you know, certainly the, the passes and just the, the overall awareness weren't as crisp as you normally would be in the midst of, of a season. But Braden Holtby was, was an absolute star and giving them a chance. And then just the, the belief grows that like, hey, I think we can do this here, guys. And, and then they end up, you know, pulling off a, a couple of wins. So, um, you know, they do have a bunch of games in, in hand here, obviously. I think it's going to be really tough sledding to, you know, even as Montreal has struggled the way that they have to, to you know, pull that off and, and uh, usurp them for fourth spot in the division. I still don't quite see it happening, um, but they at least still have an outside chance. And, and with the way things are going, who knows, maybe they burn out and, um, you know, the energy just ultimately isn't there down the stretch, which would be completely understandable. Um, but, you know, for a situation that they're in where everyone was looking at and going, gosh, how can they possibly come back and play? And man, why would you even want to play at this point? You're not in a playoff spot. What is there to play for? And for them to, to put forth the effort that they have been to this point, I think that's there. I got a lot of respect for, for those players and, and the staff there that have, have shown what, what they have uh, in their, their first few games back because they had every reason to say, you know what, this just isn't a good time and, and not a great spot for us to finish the year. And uh, they haven't used any of that as, as an excuse once the games have begun again. Uh, Elliot Friedman kind of was alluding to the fact not long ago that 
this might create some problems uh, in terms of contract negotiation. I believe the phrase he used was that some fences may need to be mended uh, going into the summer. Do you foresee any of that? Do you think there are some Canucks players who are really unhappy with how this situation has gone down? I, I It's tough for me to, to weigh in just because I'm not, you know, as plugged in as, as what's going on there. Um, but, you know, clearly there was, there was a reason why um, the virus got in the, the way that it did and, um, ultimately how it was, was handled and thinking that they were going to play on the Friday. And then ultimately that gets changed and pushed back a couple of days to give them a little bit extra time to get ready. Um, I, I think that that can be a, a strain on, uh, on everybody. Right. And so for, for those that, uh, are looking for a new contract at, at season and end, um, you know, certainly that, that could be, be part of it. But I, I, again, I'm just not, <laughs> I'm not close enough to that situation there to really have a, a finger on the pulse of, of what all of that will mean down the line when um, it comes time for, for those players in, in need of a new deal. Yeah. As the season winds down and the playoffs sort of begin, talking from a broadcaster lens, how do things change for you in your role? role? Like, does your approach to the kind of storytelling and, uh, and covering the playoff hockey change things at all? A little bit. It sh- you do shift kind of your mindset, I guess, in, in terms of the different stories you're you're looking for. Um, I mean, during the season, you know, especially on, on the nights where um, maybe the, the matchup doesn't feel as, uh, I don't want to say important, but maybe the implications aren't as, as serious as others throughout the year because you're going to have those over the course of 56 games, 82 games, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it gives you kind of the freedom to, to maybe do a little more featurish type storytelling where you're tapping into, you know, a player's background and maybe the journey um, to lay them where they, they are now, as opposed to the more hockey style adjustment type storytelling that, that uh, more speak to what's going on in the game. And that's more where you're thinking for playoffs, right? Because every moment, every shift, every icing call, every penalty, it's all so much more heightened and you want to be in tune of what's going on in the game, right? What the commentators are talking about and, and just how you can add to the overall flow and, and the storytelling and the presentation of, of the, the, the game over the broadcast, right? So that's kind of how I end up shifting my mindset a little bit there. Um, and then what's fun about being in a seven game series is that, you know, you just, you've got a lot of stuff that you have with you um, going into a series. And then after each game, you just, you, you can adjust and, and pivot and um, figure out, you know, what new stories you can add. And, and it's more so, you know, reacting to the game that just happened and, and also um, trying to maybe anticipate or to foreshadow what could happen, you know, as the series progresses. In a normal year, when you do have access to the players and staff and whatnot, do those kind of relationships change in the playoffs? Like, I, I guess what I'm asking is, if you're talking to members of the Toronto Maple Leafs on a January Wednesday night game against the Florida Panthers, is that a different interaction than like a game six against the Boston Bruins in round one of the playoffs? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Like, there's you don't have the same freedom to, I don't know, um, break the ice with with a wisecrack or anything like I don't know how much I would do of that anyways but I've always tried to to maintain just my approach in in those scenarios if you're going to go talk to player in the room like I I just I I know that they didn't wake up that morning hoping to to speak to me so if there's something that I really want to ask them or speak to them about I I go in there and um, you know politely respectfully uh, approach them and and ask them about what's what's on my mind and then you know for the most part once once that's done I, I thank them for their time and I let them get on with their day I don't need to keep them hanging around for any much longer and then I guess in 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 the playoffs it's just more of a heightened awareness around that stuff right because hockey players for the most part are so detail oriented and and so stuck in their routines like you you don't want to be the cause of of any disruption in that sense and you know that they've got stuff other stuff to worry about uh that's that's of far greater importance than any question that i have so um you got a question get in there ask it and then let them get on with their day I'm, i'm really fascinated to explore these kind of different approaches that people take within the media i'm wondering in terms of the playoffs and those kind of different situational interactions, does that just come from, from building up trust? And do you find it, I guess what I'm asking is, does it, it is it difficult to build those kind of relationships? Is it something that happens over time or is, is it one of those things where the guys just kind of get it and they're pretty easy to talk to? I know yours is probably a little more situation specific, spending a lot of time in, in Ottawa and in Toronto, but, but yeah, I'll let you have the floor there. Yeah, I think it just, again, if you're dealing with a player that you've dealt with numerous times in the past, then you know they recognize the face. They uh, have a little bit 
have a better idea what you're about and uh, they're they're more understanding of um, what you're you're looking for and, and the role that you play in this whole charade right so um, you know most part all the players are, are really good to, to deal with and even if you know you're just dealing with them for the very first time um, you know they're very respectful and 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 good to deal with some others you know they just for whatever reason don't care for being interviewed don't care for you know being you know, having a microphone in their face and, and a camera in front of them and all that and and that's fine i totally understand that and and respect that um you know teach their own in in that sense so um i, I think certainly it, it does help like in, in, in especially in the playoff times where maybe you're in a situation where um you're you're doing an interview and and it's coming off a, a loss or a tough period or something in a position where the player you're going to be talking to likely isn't the greatest of moods it does help when when you speak to somebody that you at least know a little bit and uh, there is that bit of an understanding there that uh, like look i'm not going to bury you here but like you know we do have to talk about what's what's been been going on and when you know you you've got somebody on the other other end that um, is at least willing to hear you out and play ball um, that, that does make the job a little bit easier that's uh i think that's a good segue into asking you about the whole <laughs> i was just thinking that yeah. <laughs> about the whole brad marshawn situation in 2019 and uh yeah i remember it was really funny i mean my dad loved it my dad's a diehard boston bruins fan and obviously wasn't thrilled with the way that whole playoff run ended but i mean he loves marshawn and so please correct me if i'm wrong but i believe the circumstance was because it was was it in the final or was it against carolina this was against Columbus in the second Columbus, round. sorry. Yeah, so he stomped on someone's stick, and you were doing a pregame with him, and you asked him if he had his skate resharpened or something like that? Yeah, so so in uh, I think it was an overtime of game one, yeah, before the lineup for a face-off, and he, like, blatantly stomps on the stick of right. Cam Atkinson and, like, breaks his blade. And so the day between game one and two, both players were being asked about it, and Marshawn uh, – goes off and just the only way that he can and start talking about, he goes, Oh, I think the guy, you know, he put the his stick there on purpose. He's trying to dull my skate blade. Um, you know, I goes, he was trying to dull my skate blade there. He put it there on purpose. And I, so I thought, I thought that was hilarious that, yeah. that he, he did that. So the reason why I asked the question I did in the warmups before the next game, I was trying to like play into this storyline that he had created himself. Right. Like I was, I was trying to give him runway to kind of add on to um, what he had, he had said the day previous. Um, so obviously, I mean, it was a great lesson for, for me in that, uh, it was probably the wrong time to, to ask it. Um, but, uh, anyway, so I, it, it, so that happened. And then, yeah, if you want to get to the game no, six, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, it just, it spiraled into this whole brouhaha where he kind of adopted this passive aggressive attitude towards the media. And like, I don't know, I think people kind of attribute it, attributed it to that re interaction with you. Like, did you have any sense of what was actually going on? Was he actually pissed off with you or was there, was it just him kind of, you know, goofing around? So uh, I, I was told no. And did that play a role in, in the grand scheme of things? Uh, maybe it could have. I'm certainly not going to say here, sit here and be like, no, 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 I did nothing wrong. Like I, I knew I, I made a mistake in, in the moment, but to me, my feeling like when it really changed in terms of how he interacted with the media was after game three back in Columbus, um, there was a scramble in front of Bobrovsky late in the game, a whistle, uh, Scott Harrington's down on his knees in front of the ice because he was down trying to block a shot or whatever. And Marshawn's behind them and the robo cam behind the net catches him, giving him a little rabbit punch to the back of the head. And when that went out on social, everyone went nuts, right? Because it was like, you know, typical Marshawn, yada, 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 this guy needs to be suspended. And, you know, both hockey panels, you know, both in Canada and, and the U.S., they all weighed in on it. Um, to me, it was after that moment um, that things really changed. And whenever he did his press conferences with the general media, um, you know, he was a, a little more curt, a little more short. And, uh, and we were told uh, after that game that, you know, he wasn't doing any broadcast interviews with Sportsnet or NBC that were, were airing the series. Um, so anyway, that was until game six. And uh, then um, we were told that, hey, you know, if the Boston won the game that night and consequently the series, um, he was okay to do a, an interview after the game then. Um, and then afterwards, you know, we'd hash everything out and uh, clear the air and, and move on. Uh, so I was told, all right. And so they win and, and we asked for him and he comes skating over. And, uh, and so I, he skates over. I said, Hey Brad, thanks for doing this. And it was just like silence. He didn't say anything. And I'm like, okay, this, I don't know if this is going to go very well. And so obviously not thinking that it was going to completely unfold the way that he did. But so first question, two word answer. And I'm like, okay. 
So, all right. So, next question uh, to her to answer again. So, I go, okay, well, as I said on, on the air, you know, I see where this is going. And so, the final question. And so, in my mind, like, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated just in that, like, well, why did you offer him up to us if this is what he was going to do, right? So, that's what was, was kind of frustrating in the moment. And so, that's why at the end of it, I said, like, well, that was worth it, Jim, sarcastically. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of how, that's, that's how it happened from, from our perspective and, um, or my perspective, I guess. And so it was, uh, it was just a, a great lesson that I guess, A, you know, even though, cause this was in the middle of like the Raptors were in the midst of their, uh, playoff run to an NBA championship. And we kind of thought like, you know, all the Canadian teams have been knocked out of the playoffs at that point. We thought, geez, you know, Boston, Columbus, you know, who's really watching this series now at this point, uh, turns out a few people still were. And so, uh, that got gained traction and, and, you know, ran its, its, uh, its course through the, the news cycle for the next, you know, 24, 36 hours. And, um, you know, the other real uncomfortable thing for me was just that, you know, I didn't get into this business to be part of the story. I got into it to, to help tell stories. Um, so that was the only thing that I, I didn't particularly like, but Hey, I mean, everyone has their, their own opinions and, and they're absolutely uh, right to have that. And I'm not, it's not something that, that I have an issue with, uh, anymore going forward if I ever do you know an interview with with Marshawn uh, again I haven't had a chance to since but right. um, I, I certainly don't hold any any grudges so is that a situation where may, maybe you try to relay the message to the player and say hey look like you know I, I didn't mean to cause any trouble or, or was it one of those things where you just kind of decided to let it blow over because I take it you haven't spoken to him since or anything no so yeah and after the the initial one in after game two, I went to their PR and said like, Hey, like, is, is everything all good there? And I was told like, yeah, no, no, no issues. Okay. Um, and then, so game six happened. And then I went back to do the, uh, the Boston Carolina series in the conference final. And so game one, and there was a couple of days off before game two. And so I went out there for one of their practices. And after, um, the practice in the room, I went to the one of the PR guys and said, Hey, can I talk to Brad for a few minutes? And they're like, why do you want to do that? And I said, well, I just want to clear the air. Like just say that, you know, we're all good and see if there's any issues. Um, and so, okay, well, I'll go talk to him. So I'm waiting out in the hallway. And then, so the PR guy, uh, who, I mean, they're, they're great guys to deal with. And, uh, he comes out and said, uh, you know, you know, actually, um, uh, you know, Brad's got a meeting coming up here. It's just you know, a busy time and, and it's just not, not going to work. And so I said, all right, Fine. So then I just left it, right? I guess I'm not going to spend the rest of the playoffs running around trying to uh, talk to him for 30 seconds to a minute. Like if it's if it's not a priority to him and totally understand that he's not, like he's in the midst of trying to win a Stanley Cup at that point, um, no issues. So we'll we'll just leave it be. And then um, you know didn't really have a chance to the next year, and now we've been in a pandemic. So I don't know. My belief is if you brought it up to him now, like he wouldn't even remember what it was, yeah. right, or what what you're talking about. Um, it was just such a small. Uh, instance again over the course of two months of, of what is just an absolutely grueling grind to to try to win the ultimate trophy in, in the sport right so yeah. Um, yeah it's just it's for me now it's just it's it's fun to to laugh about um, in the aftermath probably something that would have gone over a little better with him within the context of a regular season game too right like you think maybe the playoffs had something to play something, something <laughs> yeah to exactly yeah all of yeah. that it, again it was a, a great learning experience for myself so I, I take that with me moving forward did, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm interested to, that you call it a learning experience because, I mean, going back and watching it, like, I, I didn't really think you did anything wrong. It might have been a bit out of left field, but it, it, but it seemed like you really hit a nerve with him for some reason. Uh, did it affect the way that you covered uh, that playoffs or even kind of how you've gone forward in terms of your coverage? Like, is that is that something that you think about in, in the sense that it, it affects what you do today? No, I, I don't. Like, I, I don't think like it's, it's only comes to my mind when, when I, I get asked about it. Right. So, um, it's, I, I no, it doesn't change what, what I do. And, and, and again, it's just more so the understanding of, of the moment, the situation and, and what makes most sense at the time. And, and so part of what, why I did at the time too, is because those over the boards interviews during warmups, um, they can be so, uh, so predictable and so cookie cutter, right? And yeah. part of it, again, is because, you know, the player's half an hour away from the game started and his mind's buzzing. And he just wants to focus on what he's doing in his routine and warm up. So you don't want to, you know, go down the path of anything too um, out of left field, as as you said. So, um, but again, I'm always thinking of like, well, what's something different you can do to just, you know, um, get something a little more interesting out of your, your interview subject. And, and so part of it was the first round that year against Toronto, um, one of our camera guys heard in the lead up to warm up before that game where I had Marshawn as, as a, 
an interview during warmups again, um, he had like broken a stick over a, over the, the corner of a wall just outside the, the visitor's dressing room in, in Toronto. And uh, we talked about like the stick needed to be sacrificed, right, for, for the game that night. Um, so I, I asked him about it during, during the warm-up. I say, you know, there's reports out there that, that a stick was sacrificed before the game here tonight. Like, can you confirm that? And so he played along with it. He just kind of laughed and was like, oh, I'll talk to you about it later. And then Boston won that night, and we interviewed him after the game and asked him again about it, and, and it ended up being a, a neat little tidbit, right? So um, at least I, I, had, I had gone down a bit of a different path with him before. One time it worked, uh, the other time it didn't. Well, now you're part of a, an iconic moment in the Stanley Cup playoffs history, at least with regards to <laughs> where the Canadian media side of things is concerned. Although, like you said, it did gain substantial airplay in the U.S. as well. As we kind of roll into these playoffs, and Sens fans are going to hate me asking this, is there any team that is going to have more eyes on them than the Toronto Maple Leafs? No, and that's, uh, you know, until they get knocked out, that's that's the same way every year since they've been back in it, right? In 2017, um, because of the market they're in, because of how long it's been since they've won, uh, and because of the the star power too, right? And, yeah. and playing. It's almost those... a compounding thing too, right? Like the more they lose, the more people kind of watch them, the more they fail to get by the first round, especially last year against like Columbus. Like, did, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, is that no, one of those no, things no. That, that builds up on it too? Exactly. Yeah. Like when is this team finally going to break through? And I, I, I agree with you. This is the, the best opportunity that they've had under the, you know, the Brendan Shanahan era uh, to, to go deep. And so we'll, we'll see. I mean, they've, they've hit a bit of a, a bump in the road here of, of late and they got to figure out their, their goaltending. And certainly the, the injury to, to Zach Hyman doesn't help them because he's such a catalyst for, for them. And hopefully it really is only just a, a couple of weeks and he's back in time for, for playoffs. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's, there's going to be a huge, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of hype, a lot of eyeballs will be keying in on them. And, you know, there's some that obviously the diehard fans that want to see them finally do well. There's those that just from an outside, outside perspective, want to see, you know, this plan that they put together and the roster that they have assembled, will they finally win? And then there's a large vast of people that just want to see the whole thing burn, right? They tune in hoping that they will lose, right? I wouldn't know anything what, about that. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, and not that anybody in, in this city of Ottawa would do that, but, no, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, so that, that just comes with the, the territory of being in the market that, they, that they're in. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's no question until they get knocked out. Uh, there, there won't be a bigger story in this country than um, what are the Leafs doing in the playoffs. Yeah, this has been fantastic, Kyle. I appreciate you taking the time. I don't want to keep you too much longer. But the one thing I'm curious to know before we go here, what's the thing that you're most looking forward to uh, going into the playoffs? Like uh, we're starting to kind of get a better idea now of what teams are going to be in it um, and maybe even something in the way of what the kind of matchups are going to look like. What's the storyline that you are most curious to see play out? In the North? Anywhere. Oh, anywhere. Oh, man. I, <laughs> the most, one I'm most interested in. I, I think it's inter It's weird for me to say this just because I feel, I felt so disconnected from like the, t the other three divisions playing in the States just because of the way the schedule has been this year. Um, but I mean, you know, I look down in the, I guess the South division um, and, you know, seeing Carolina up at the top and, you know, Tampa Bay believing they've got a team that can, repeat again um but i'll go with you know what's what's happening in the east and you had like i think all those all four of of the top teams in that division like all added at the deadline all believe they have a shot and it's just going to be a slug fest to see who eventually comes out of that one and what are they going to have left in the tank to uh see what they've got against uh, whoever they match up against in in the third round so um, that that's going to be real fascinating to, to watch. And, and again, it hasn't felt right that I've felt so disconnected from uh, three quarters of, of the league this year. Um, but certainly as now we get closer to the playoffs, I, I look forward to paying more attention of, of what's going on there and, and just the, the battle that's, that's going to ensue, right? The first round of the playoffs are always so thrilling and pay, played at such a high pace. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be really fun to watch to see how those teams uh, go about battling it out.
Yeah, my girlfriend's least favorite time of year because there's hockey on every night in the first round of the playoffs. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's been great chatting with you, great getting your insight on the Sens and the kind of broader media landscape, especially during the age of COVID. So Kyle Bukoskis, thank you for doing it. I really do appreciate it. My pleasure, Brandon. Thank you for having me on. Folks, make sure you follow Kyle on Twitter at SN Kyle Bukoskis. Make sure you like the podcast, share with your friends, download, subscribe, rate five stars, all those fun things that go a long way and are greatly appreciated. You can catch another episode of the podcast next week. Please, in the meantime, stay healthy and stay safe. Take care, everybody.